moment. And I'll get this screen share started, but just for issues of potential interruption, I will stop my video. So I apologise for people not being able to see me, you lucky things. Um, and make sure presenter view vanishes, so hopefully everybody can see that. Is that working okay? Good, good. Right. Um, yeah, so thank you very much. No, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to, to be here again um, talking to everybody. Um, and yes, this evening I'd like to talk about some of the evidence for religious interactions with museums and heritage sites. Um, these are often very discreet and quite personal, and because of that, they don't tend to factor into the way that we think about or interpret those sites and objects. And there are two strands of recent research that have led me to thinking about this subject. Um, the first, the ongoing influence of the Roman world on modern society, and the second is about contemporary religious objects in museums. So although my focus is on Roman Britain, I do think it's important to put these things into a wider context. Now it's not particularly controversial to say that the Roman world has always exuded some fascination. I mean people still do crazy things like giving up their valuable time to attend evening lectures on it for example. Um, but an interesting focus of research in recent years has looked at just how much our personal and collective understandings of our Roman heritage continue to influence our identities. That it's not just something of academic archaeological interest but something that continues to influence how we see ourselves both as individuals and at a wider national level. There's been, for example, some interesting work uh, recently by Chiara Bonacci at the University of Stirling, who's shown how Britain's role in the Roman Empire was being evoked on both sides of the Brexit debate. Uh, I apologise for using the, the B word, I should have put up a warning. Um, but that it continues to be seen as a, a model of brutal imperial colonialism or a high point of continental unity or a, a glorious highlight of civilization ultimately brought low by corruption and immigration, none of which is necessarily either entirely accurate or entirely wrong. Um, what's important though isn't so much the accuracy of the claims, though it, it would be nice if academic discourse was able to influence these things a little more effectively, um, but rather that they exist in the first place, that the Roman world continues to be used in very contemporary political debates. For many Christians, Rome was the empire that turned from executing Christ and persecuting Christians to being the empire that embraced Christianity and forged its prominent role in the Western world. And again, many of the narratives that get presented surrounding that are, are quite ahistorical, but I'm not going to go into to that here. And again, what's important is that it's how people perceive the period that it's still used and, and seen as relevant. The Bell Scott painting that you can see here shows a, a young convert to Christianity bringing the light of that religion to dark pagan practices, respected by the, the old woman by the altar. Um, and it's reflective of, of how Greco-Roman paganism might be seen, something of the past, something replaced as an active religious system by a religion which, to be fair, has gone on to be rather successful. Um, you know, something that has become redundant, a dead religion. The other strand that I'm interested in is about how the study of contemporary religion has changed in recent decades, particularly in relation to how religious objects in museum, mu you know, museums are seen. Religions are quite vibrant, emotive things, and there's been a, an interesting scholarly development in recent decades known as material religion, which has highlighted that even with the, the major monotheisms, the religions of the book, which value internalised piety and have very intellectualised apologetics, objects and places are still central to creating and maintaining people's identities and practices. The objects aren't secondary to those, they aren't mere set dressing, they are what religious acts are made of. But this leads us to the issue of what happens to religious objects when they enter museums. Museum objects often get seen as effectively dead. Any original vitality they had is killed off by rational scientific categorization and passive displays behind glass that emphasize their aesthetic value and little else. They can be seen as having lost any power that they had to evoke emotional or spiritual responses. And this is especially true of ancient religions. I think if we're honest, we see religious objects from Roman Britain very much as a category of archaeological find rather than as once vibrant, emotive and numinous objects. 
However, the scholarship into religious objects in museums has almost entirely overlooked the ancient world so far. So what I want to explore this evening is the idea that not everybody does see these objects this way, that there's an amount of engagement that occurs at both museums and at landscape sites that we're not always aware of, and which might prompt archaeologists and museum curators to begin to think about them differently. So I want to start by looking at some interactions with religion in museums, some of which are covert and some of which are not quite so covert. And I hope that you'll forgive me staying with contemporary religion for just a few moments before turning to the Roman world, because as I say, this, is, this sort of area is beginning to be much better studied. And I think it's a guide and a starting point for considering what might be occurring with more ancient religious sites and objects. So the British Museum held two major religious exhibitions in 2011 and 2012. And there was a related research project by a then PhD student called Steph Burns, which focused on observing and interviewing various visitors to those exhibitions. And the first of those exhibitions was called Treasures of Heaven and was held in, in 2011, <laughs> you can see here. A lecture about Romans in the North East. Do you want to watch it, Louis? <laughs> no, somebody's uh, un unmuted there. <laughs> um, and the Treasures of Heaven exhibition centred on uh, Catholic reliquaries. And the research that was done by Steph Burns revealed a whole host of interactions with the objects, which undermined this idea that they're dead or lacking ongoing potency. And while museum etiquette, as we might call it, stopped a great many people from dropping prostate or onto their knees, some did express a strong desire to make such gestures, and many more made very subtle gestures of faith, such as genuflecting or, or bowing their heads. Others would put their hands to the glass, they'd kiss the glass cases or touch their foreheads to it, or they'd hold up objects that they'd brought with them, or even guidebooks and souvenirs they bought at the museum, to turn them into secondary relics, the idea that they would absorb the power of the relic on display through the glass, and that could then be taken away with them. But many of these actions, of course, passed rather unseen by other visitors and by the museum staff, and any greasy traces of such devotional acts left on glass cases were wiped away during the day. Similar interactions were noted during the second of the exhibitions, the Hajj exhibition the following year, and particularly with this display of a replica of the Kaaba, which is the sacred structure at Mecca. It's covered with specially made textiles um, at the time of the Hajj pilgrimage, which are displayed here and were on open display. And some visitors reported not being able to resist reaching out to touch them, despite acknowledging that it was forbidden by the museum. The religious significance of them, the fact that they had been in this sacred place, the, the pull that they exuded was absolutely um, overriding. The British Museum is also the site of Bible tours, which are hosted by Jehovah's Witnesses groups, and various ancient religions do feature very much in these. However, they're used purely as a means for reaffirming the faith of the tourists. And in the case of this specific example, it's ancient Egypt. And as the, the quote from The Independent here notes, um, for these tourists, oh, my screen has actually been covered by the, <laughs> by the thing. Let me go back, sorry. Um, for these tourists, the, the idols incandesce with meaning. The tours are frequently polemical. The guides attack the carved gods as still present antagonists. Egypt is Satan's world. Their gods were judged and shown to be useless. So there's a very specific challenge being made against the museum's narratives. And observations of these tours have shown that the museum interpretation often isn't engaged with at all unless it's to directly challenge it. And some tourists, for example, avoid bending down in front of objects to read the labels in case it be interpreted as an act of bowing down before a false idol. <coughs> Excuse me. And these are tours that continue to be held. They've even gone online during the pandemic. The Truth Will Set You Free, in particular, um, aims to demonstrate the falsehoods of religion in the ancient world. And so this is therefore a very different form of engagement with displays of ancient religion than we often think of when we talk of museum visitors going to museums to be educated or to be, or to be entertained. But it's not only Christians or Muslims, of course, who want to make religious gestures in museums. Some pagans do as well. Modern paganism is a complex phenomenon. Um, it's not one that we can do a deep dive into here but it encompasses a whole range of individual beliefs and identities that might also be termed polytheism, 
heathenry, spirituality, new age, etc. Though different people might embrace or reject these, these various labels. It might involve drawing on one or more ancient religious traditions, deep prehistory, Celtic, Greco-Roman, Norse, or indeed none of those. So although the, the Druids at Stonehenge, as you see pictured here, do form a particularly memorable and, and even dominant stereotype, particularly in the media, they really are only one aspect of a much wider and more diverse phenomenon. Some pagans attempt to emulate specific historic practices, whereas others might draw on them for inspiration, but aren't necessarily overly concerned with recreating anything specific. And so whereas issues of authenticity are something that archaeologists can get very hung up on, it's not necessarily that important to those practitioners. Others, in contrast, can become quite frustrated if their interpretations of ancient religious beliefs and practices aren't seen as being taken seriously by academics. And so there's a huge amount of scholarship into modern paganism, but its focus has been overwhelmingly on prehistoric or Celtic studies. Uh, for example, there was a, a significant project studying pagan engagement with museums and archaeology in the early 2000s, which was called Sacred Sites, but it looked exclusively at prehistory. None of the project's research or, or subsequent publications considered the Roman period at all, despite some of the fundamental connections between later prehistoric Celtic religious practices and the growth of Roman influence in the northwestern provinces. And so we see the Roman period sitting in something of a strange limbo between prehistory and later paganism, such as North mythology. And this perhaps ties in with more general perceptions of the Roman world as somehow cold and systematic uh, rather than emotional that its religion was one of rites and structures, but not necessarily genuine feelings. And I would argue, of course, that that's a, a common and persistent perception, but one which overlooks a lot of evidence for very real and emotional religious experiences in the ancient world. And so the quote from an online blog here shows that pagans actually encounter some of the same difficulties in museums that we noted with the Treasures of Heaven exhibition earlier. Um, this was a, a blogger who was doing a, a tour of Europe, talking about how these you know, museums are inspiring and breathtaking but one thing that I've been really struggling with is encountering my gods in the museums. Some of the statues I've seen make me want to get down on my knees and worship, pour libations, to spend hours in contemplation and meditation. Unfortunately though museums aren't exactly suited to this kind of activity. The closest I've come is sitting down on one of the occasional benches that could be found, attempt to ignore the hordes of tourists and try to pray quietly to myself. So here we can see again, museum etiquette and behavioural expectations make it difficult to actively perform acts of worship. And this same blog actually highlights another relevant issue, which is that whereas religions such as Christianity, Islam, Judaism, etc. have dedicated religious structures and places where religious objects can be engaged with in non-museum settings, for pagans, and certainly for those worshipping Greco-Roman gods, the original objects they venerate are really only found in museum galleries. Museums in this sense become active temples. But as we'll see in some of the following examples, it's really only when people write about their experiences on the internet that, that we can easily access them. Now it's interesting to consider as well that it's not just visitors who can think of their interactions with objects in different ways. And this is from another blog post um, by a pagan who volunteers at the Polar Museum in Tromsø in Norway. And he recalls that while cleaning the face of uh, this bust of Roald Amundsen, the polar explorer, which I think is a fantastic portrait, um, he was minded to think of acts of devotion to cult statuary in the ancient world. So he wrote that, I lightly wet my cloth and apply a thin veneer of disinfectant on Amundsen's face. At that moment, it hit me. In some way, does my rather profane act not mirror the work of pagan priests of yore? I'm not quite sure when yore is exactly. I think it's somewhere in the Middle Ages. I'm not sure. Um, those who would dedicate themselves to a temple deity and devotedly wash the hands and feet of their beloved gods and esteemed heroes. Now, what he's referring to has precedence in the Roman world. Seneca, for example, described his disgust at how over the top some people were when interacting with cult statues. He talks of people giving the names of worshippers, another announcing the hours. One is his bather, another his anointer. That is, he gestures with empty hands to imitate the act of anointing. There are women who are hairdressers for Juno and Minerva. 
while standing far away from the temple, as well as from the image, they move their fingers as if they were dressing the hair, but there are others who hold a mirror. Now, I know we can notice that the, the contact with the idol that Seneca describes is only simulated contact. This sort of potential interaction with cult images is actually something that isn't well interpreted in museums, um, although it might well have occurred in Britain with statues like that of, of Sulis Minerva from Bath that you can see pictured here. So it's interesting to think that some pagan worshippers are viewing statuary in this way. Their religious beliefs and practices are enabling them to think of the objects and interactions with them in a very different way that other visitors and staff might do. Yet another example comes from another pagan blogger and this time a visit to Tully House Museum in Carlisle to see some of the, the carved stone heads, which you can see in the background there. And I think this one is a particularly valuable insight because it transmits some of the genuine emotion they felt at the encounter and the idea that the sculptures are in some way being denied their true agency in a museum context, effectively being trapped within their cases. And again, as the person is saying, they weren't prepared to see them all together at once. It took them by surprise when they encountered them in the museum. It was overwhelming and rather peculiar seeing them packed into four cabinets, some headless, limbless or defaced. I managed to get my act together and speak their names, those I knew, those I didn't. Images of deities sculpted 2,000 years ago, revered, now viewed in an entirely different context. And I think this is also a good example to consider the very Roman nature of such so-called Celtic imagery. Now, obviously, I can't say anything about this individual blogger's beliefs, and I, I in no way want to impugn them, but it seems likely that these are being seen as Celtic heads and therefore representative of prehistoric beliefs in the area. And you might say, well, of course they are. But we need to consider that these things are being produced in the Roman period, probably the third century, and in an anthropomorphic manner, which reflects the Roman influence on Northwestern European religious sculpture. The people who made these heads may well not have been indigenous at all. And as they have stylistic connections with heads found in Germany, it's likely that they're the products of individuals who were only in Northern Britain because of the Roman military presence, and who themselves have been influenced by the spread of Roman ideas. So as I said earlier, although authenticity isn't always important to modern pagans, it's interesting to reflect that the Roman context and the influences on such sculpture is often entirely overlooked in favour of a somehow purer, animistic, prehistoric interpretation. It's indicative of how the Roman period is seen as this centralising imperialist force but it doesn't recognise the cultural integration and nuance that we see at more local scales. It shows that the Roman religious landscape isn't being seen as one connected to nature or spirituality in the same way, and therefore somehow not as attractive to some modern pagans. But again, this sincere, meaningful, emotive interaction in the museum was one that likely passed completely unknown to the staff, and without the blog, it would have left no public legacy at all. So again, it's a good example of the kind of things that might be happening a lot more commonly than we realise. And it does seem that it's much rarer for pagans to formally request access to ancient religious material in museums, although it's not something I think there's any formal data, um, certainly not that I'm aware of. We do have occasional anecdotes, such as this one recorded in the museum's journal in 2008, when a pagan group um, seems to have approached the Senhouse Museum at Maryport. And the, the note says, we have been approached by pagan groups to do ceremonies on one of our other unique sculptures called the Serpent Stone. This is an altar that was recycled late in the Roman period. It's about three feet high with a serpent carved on one side and a Celtic human head on the other. It's a phallic shape. It's very attractive to pagans. We put them off nicely. Now, obviously we, we don't know what the actual requests have been um, and what the proposed ceremonies entailed, but I think it's perhaps a bit of a shame that the tone here does suggest that it was never going to be seriously considered even if it posed no risk to the object. It does raise some questions over who has the authority to legitimately access archeological finds for religious reasons, and whether this is a debate that we should actually be having more openly. Would a monotheistic group, for example, be similarly denied a request to pray over an object? So far, the interaction between pagans and museums seems to have been dominated by very well publicized arguments over prehistoric human remains. Um, though that's something I'm, I'm definitely not going to be uh, going into here. But with that in mind, let's turn to the issue of offerings left at Romano-British religious sites, where of course no formal permission 
generally needs to be sought. This is a, a site that I know many of you will be familiar with. This is the, the Currabruff Mithraeum on Hadrian's Wall. And if you have been there, then it's very likely that there have been various offerings left in the focus of the central replica altar. Uh, this, for example, is an image that I took in 2018. And as you can see, the offering assemblage consists of mainly coins, along with a poker chip, so a token coinage, um, with a, a single seed to the left and perhaps the small pebble at the front as, as additional offerings. On a visit uh, only a year later, we can see a slightly different assemblage. We can see coins again, uh, which do generally seem to be the most common offering overall, but a more varied assemblage in total. We have stones, we have flowers, we have wool, um, a seashell, which might not be entirely local, um, and the, the pinky substance to the right may be perhaps traces of, of where a wax candle has been. Now, the offerings that are placed on the altars are periodically emptied, but I'm not aware of any formal record being kept of what does get offered. And I think there might be potential to get some interesting data at some point on, on what those offering assemblages are and, and how they change over time, if, if some analysis on those could be done. Because I think there are some interesting questions as to what extent these offerings, even if they are things that are just gathered locally in the vicinity of the site, are being specially selected. Are some things actually being brought to the site just to be offered? Are people being influenced by what's already there or what they might have seen being left previously on other visits? Perhaps most importantly, what's the motivation? Is this just a simple superstition? Is this akin to just tossing coins in a wishing well? Or is there, for some people at least, a more specific need being met? Is there a recognition that the deity, Mithras in this instance, um, that the original altar was, was dedicated to? The focus of an altar as a place of deposition is, is clearly an important factor. Otherwise, we'd see similar offerings left on all kinds of prosaic stonework around this site and others. So the religious origins of the place and the altar specifically are clearly being recognised as special. And there's knowledge that the focus of an altar is somewhere where offerings were placed, even though, of course, in a Roman context, they would be offered into a fire lit in the, in the focus rather than just left as offerings on the surface. This is an image again of that exact same altar focus, this time a photograph taken by Richard Hingley of, of Durham University and published in 2015. The large token here is a Ten Commandments token made by a company called needgod.com. And we can perhaps see this as a kind of anti-offering, um, made just like the other supposedly genuine offerings, but in this case intended to make future dedicators reflect on the nature of their religious options. For whoever left this, the pagan nature of the original altar was clearly significant and the bringing of the token to deposit can't have been accidental. The altar and the offerings left on it are therefore clearly perceived as possessing some power or influence over people. To whoever left the token, they present a challenge to their modern faith. A little bit more unusual is this image, which was taken by a visitor to the Housestead Site Museum in 2011 and thankfully for us posted on Flickr. Um, offerings within museum displays are really incredibly rare, as far as I can tell, um, especially where they might have been allowed to build up over a period of time, as museum staff are usually pretty quick to remove such things, which is something I'll, I'll come back to later. Here's that same altar um, in another photograph from that same visit. Um, the display doesn't actually exist anymore in the format. The museum's been redisplayed subsequently. But you can see that the offerings, hopefully just about see the glint of some of the coins, the offerings are in the altar to the right. And we might ask why this altar in particular? Um, the altar on the right with the offerings is an altar to Jupiter. The one in the center, which doesn't seem to have any offerings at all, is to Mars. Although we might think that this lovely image on the front might make it more attractive rather than the slightly plain, purely inscribed altar that has been offered to. Um, so were the deities inscribed on the altars a factor? Maybe not at all, but it's interesting to consider what is influencing the decisions. Was this a single act by a person that just happened to be caught soon afterwards on camera by another visitor? Or is this an accumulation by multiple people over a period of time that for whatever reason wasn't removed by the museum staff? And what are the thoughts, words or actions accompanied reaching out across the, the display threshold and dropping the coins in? Was it something that somebody deliberately waited to make sure that they weren't going to be seen doing? before they did it for fear of being caught and told off perhaps 
what made it so important to, to even take that risk. Now, close to the, the Caribou of Mithraeum, um, of course, is, is another fairly well-known religious site, Coventine as well. And the two sites can be seen as part of the, the wider civilian and ritual hinterland of, of the Caribou Fort, as you can see on the, on the plan here. Now, Coventina is actually quite a fascinating deity due to the modern interest that she's attracted. And it's probably not too crazy to suggest that she has more adherents now than she ever did in her Roman heyday. Um, a Google search will reveal a vast number of websites discussing her contemporary worship and many modern drawings of her, such as, as this example here, um, most notably portraying her as a goddess of springs and of, of healing. And the, the quote from a, one of the many websites to her here says, the following will give some idea what it can be like to revere a deity, but note that different individuals may well experience a given deity in different ways. Coventina and I share a particularly intimate, consistent, and truly loving relationship. In response to the debate as to whether she is a healer, she is, because she has given me healing on a number of occasions. And although some websites, including the one that I've, I've referenced here, do actually provide fairly decent overviews of the archaeological evidence from Coventina as well, others present interpretations that are much more fanciful, um, despite claiming to present evidence to ancient origins for some of the modern beliefs that are applied to her. But it is telling, however, that despite the intensely Roman context of the shrine and its relationship to the fort and the temple of Mithras that we've just seen, despite the fact that the original offerings placed in the, the rectangular stone tank that we refer to as the well are Roman in nature, their inscriptions and anthropomorphic images on stone, such as the examples you can see here, which are in the, the Chester's Museum. Um, other offerings include brooches and coins. Coventina is generally seen as being absolutely native and Celtic. So again, we see this distinct tendency to ignore entirely the Roman influences on the nature of such deities and how they were worshipped. The way people perceive the Roman period and its religious activity seems to simply make it an undesirable part of the narratives that some people want to create. And it's very likely that many people across the world who are into goddess worship and have come across Coventina online are completely unaware of the archaeological evidence, the contextualized setting of the well and its Roman dating. She's therefore taken on an entirely new life of her own. Some of the websites even describe specific rituals to perform to Coventina, such as, as this one here, where you can see you need a body of water, such as a fountain or even just a bowl, and a coin. It says you cast a circle, you surround yourself with a protective circle of light, you feel peace and protection, you close your eyes and you picture yourself walking to the shrine, carrying your offering, thinking of what you want to ask, and then saying a chant three times and tossing your offering into the, the, the well or the, or the watery place. And I think it's interesting to consider whether any rituals like this one, similar ones to this, might have been performed at the site of the well itself, even though there's now nothing there that can be seen. I can imagine they probably have been, maybe even multiple times. But if so, it's seemingly another mostly hidden interaction that doesn't currently form part of how we generally think of the site and how people engage with it. Now, sadly, not all interactions with ancient religion are entirely positive. Um, the pictures here are from a, a contemporary project um, by a group of Greco-Roman pagans in the Ukraine um, to rebuild a working Roman temple complex. This is an ongoing project. Um, the first building they finished is this temple to Jupiter Perennis that you can see here on the right. And they're actually quite an active group. Uh, their Facebook page reports that they performed 157 offering ceremonies this year to the start of November. So almost one every other day. However, in 2011, when that temple was just starting to be built, and you can see the, the very early foundations of it here, it was attacked by an Orthodox Christian group. Um, one of the pagan priests working on the site was hospitalized in the attack, and the message, die heathens, was graffitied on the walls amid other damage being caused. Um, now, it's, it's fair to say that such incidents aren't always entirely one way. Um, there are some ultra-nationalist pagan groups in Eastern Europe, not, not this group, I, I, I hasten to add, um, but that have been responsible for similar attacks on Orthodox Christian groups. And it's yet more evidence of how the ancient world and ancient religion 
can still be very much an active part of modern identities and of social, political and religious tensions. Now, this is um, an inscription on stone which was found in the village of Nettleham near Lincoln, uh, which is now in the Collection Museum in Lincoln, which, is, as David mentioned earlier, I used to be the, the archaeology curator of. So it's, it's an object that I, that I know well. And if I just bring up the inscription there, hopefully you can see it um, a little bit better. Um, so it reads, Deo Marti Rigonometi et Numinibus Augustorum, Quintus Naratius Proximus, Arkham Desuo Donowit which basically translates to mean that it's recording an arch set up to the, the syncretized, the combined god Mars Rigonometis, which can be translated as Mars, king of the sacred grove, and the, the Numen, the divine spirit of the emperor, by a chap with the great name of Quintus Neratius Proximus, who paid for it out of his own pocket. And the inscription was found by chance during house building works um, in 1961. What's particularly interesting, however, and the reason that I, I raise it here, is the response to that discovery by the local vicar, whose reaction actually made the national newspapers, such as the, the Daily Herald clipping here. He suggested that the discovery explained an air of evil existing in the village, and suggested that the discovery of the, of the inscription made him question, quote, whether all the evil that went into pagan worship at the Grove has been entirely obliterated. Now, I find this a particularly fascinating reaction because it actually attributes an enormous amount of power to this ancient deity, power which seemingly still existed. Rather than being labelled a false god, the vicar actually seems to be suggesting that Mars Rigonometis possessed ongoing and very tangible efficacy. So it demonstrates yet again, as we saw with the, the Bible tours earlier, that ancient gods can still have a very active role to play in people's own modern faiths and how they perceive other supernatural forces and their actions in the world. Now, while I was traveling between uh, Durham and, and Edinburgh a couple of weeks ago, um, I stopped off at Benwell to a site that, again, some of you may well know, know very, very well, uh, to a, a quick trip to the, the remains of the Temple of Antenakiticus. And I noticed something while I was there that, that sparked my interest with this talk in mind. Now, the site there has a, a, a really well done um, interpretation panel, re really good quality panel. But sadly, it has been slightly vandalized, uh, but only and perhaps meaningfully in one place, which is on the reconstruction drawing of the temple interior, the dark square that you can see roughly in the, the middle of the panel. So if I zoom in and you can hopefully see quite clearly the deliberate scratching, the scribbled scratching, which is specifically targeting the statue of Antenna Kittikus. Now, this isn't the only human figure on the panel, but it is the only naked figure. So one possibility is that this is due to a desire to somehow censor the, the nudity of the image. Or might it be because it's a representation of an ancient deity? It has to be said, though, the original statue head, which is in the Great North Museum collections, um, is imaged on the panel and that hasn't been touched. So perhaps that makes it less likely. But there's clearly some reason why the statue image in particular has been targeted. It's a good example of how damage to panels like this might reflect more in-depth and deliberate decision-making rather than just random mindless damage. How, where and why people damage heritage interpretation isn't something that's been particularly studied. But whatever the motivation here is, we do I think have to see it as a very deliberate response to the site and its interpretive narratives. And so to bring things to a close, I just want to look at how some museums are beginning to engage with religious interactions in a more proactive and positive way. In 1991, um, Philip Fisher wrote here that it would be rather odd if somebody were to start making offerings in, in front of a painting for the Virgin Mary, lighting candles and, and leaving offerings on the floor before leaving the museum. And I think many of us would definitely find it strange if a fellow visitor did that while we were also visiting a museum. Yet to circle back where I started the talk, some museums have been taking steps to bridge that gap between the, the rational categorised museum and the desire of some to continue to enact acts of religious worship in front of religious objects. Particularly in the United States, some museums have allowed altars to have offerings placed on them, such as the, the voodoo altar pictured here and sometimes even subsequently accessioned the assemblages of objects left on them into their permanent collections. 
Other museums have placed religious objects on open display rather than behind glass at the request of religious groups to enable prayers to take place, or they've made arrangements for religious groups to be able to gather for worship in front of certain objects on specific holy days. Birmingham Museum and Art Gallery, for example, have hosted an annual Buddha Day for the past 15 years, at which multiple different Buddhist communities from across the city come together to worship in the gallery in front of a, a, a very significant statue known as the Sultan Ganj Buddha, which you can see the, the bronze statue in the middle background. But these steps are, so far to my knowledge, um, only involving major contemporary faiths. They haven't really considered alternate belief systems such as paganism, and they haven't really begun to influence the way we think about and display the religions of Rome and Britain. Of course, there's the Faith Museum at Bishop Auckland, which again, some of you may well be, be aware of, which is currently in development. Um, and it's gonna be interesting to see how that engages with its aim to contemplate the history of faith in Britain and what it means in the present day. And as you might imagine, I'm particularly interested to see how religion in Roman Britain is gonna be presented and whether its ongoing relevance to religious identities is gonna be considered or whether it might just become a point on an early timeline, one of those ancient dead religions consigned to irrelevance. We will have to wait and see. And so to conclude, there's potentially an awful lot of interaction going on that we're not generally aware of, and to be honest, aren't really even looking for. Um, whether it's people actively worshipping ancient gods or decrying them to promote other faiths, whether it's people making religious gestures in museums or wanting to and not feeling able to, or just the private conversations about religion that visitors have with each other. We have to admit that we don't really know how most people think of the Roman period, especially not its religious activity, or indeed how people's religious beliefs influence their acceptance or rejection of the academic interpretations we present. We also have the other issue that a lot of activity involving religious sites and objects from Roman Britain might not actually be being perceived as Roman at all by the people doing it. This desire to imagine and engage with naturalistic, animistic interpretations of prehistory lead to the very real Roman influences being deliberately sidelined, as I've mentioned. But alternative spiritualities are growing and they will continue to rise. Paganism is probably the fastest growing religion in Britain at the moment. And this may become a stakeholder group that we have to engage with more and more over issues beyond the aforementioned human remains. So ultimately, I think we have to reflect more carefully that some visitors view this religious heritage as part of their identity rather than just archaeological evidence of academic interest. And we have to recognize that archaeologists and museum curators possess an awful lot of control, a lot of authority over objects and sites that for some people are of very active and ongoing religious significance. But I think there are some very interesting avenues for potential research to begin to understand more about just what religion in Roman Britain does actually mean for people. And I would, of course, be very interested in any experiences or anecdotal evidence that, uh, that you have on this subject. And I will finish there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anthony. That was that was really, really rather wonderful. Um, and I think just going by the, the comments in the chat, um, you, you've clearly kind of provoked lots of lots of conversation and, and thought. Um, I'm going to hand over to Paul, who will do yeah. his uh, his compare act and uh, and and, and uh, send the questions your way. Yeah, keep the questions coming, everybody. Keep, keep the questions coming. Anything that occurs to you, and anything, that, anything that occurs to you while we're having the discussion, keep the questions coming. Um, is, I don't know. <laughs> I, I'm I'm very intrigued by one of your final statements there when you said that paganism is um, possibly the fastest growing religion in Britain at the moment. Because I'd already actually noted down um, we should we 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 have to arrange a separate session. I mean, I know paganism is a very wide ranging kind of a thing, but we've got to arrange a separate session to address some of these um, questions relating to paganism, I think. And I suspect from the questions that there are, or the comments, there are quite a few people who, who would be interested in that. Um, some surveying done, people out on site. <laughs> what do you believe? Yeah. What, what are you doing yes. here? <laughs> well, well, I mean, that would be great. I mean, I, I, I distinctly remember, so, sorry, you know, I, I always turn the conversation to things Neolithic when we start talking <laughs> about Romans, but I, I remember work, when we were working out at Long Meg, we had somebody come and visit. Um, who, who was, you know, for want of a better word, a pagan. And we were working on the spring salt um, equinox. And uh, to start with, there was a bit of, you shouldn't be doing this. And then by the end of the discussion, she was a signed up volunteer and came on numerous other excavations that we did and was totally hooked. So um, there, there's, you know, there, there, there's, 
there's all sorts of links there, ways of building relationships with people. But um, yeah. I, I just, yeah, there's loads of ideas going on in my head. But just to go to some of the questions that people are asking, um, I, I'd already kind of made a note about the link with ethnographic um, collections and objects being displayed in, in Native American and maybe Australian and lots of other places as well. So we'll start with a question from Canada. Thank you for sending this question all the way from Canada, which is basically that. Um, is this, this uh, the whole business that you're talking about, the idea of gods in museums? Do you think that links with the whole, this, this issue of um, how ethnographic objects should be or are being displayed in, um, in places like America and Canada and Australia? That I mean, yeah, those sorts of objects are definitely the the driving force behind this. A lot of this new way of thinking about religion in museums and religious objects has come from yeah. So it's, it's, it's a word that yeah, provokes heckles rising on some people, but decolonization. Yeah, this basic idea of democratizing museums, making sure that a much wider range of voices are represented in museums and a lot of the driver for that has very much been yeah the the, the first nations first peoples approach you know the ethnographic materials um in in the us and, and canada so i think there's a lot of interesting parallels um a lot of recent work on on you know the roman world is taking a lot of its cue from anthropology um I don't know obviously if you're in the states, anthropology and archaeology. I mean, there's a slightly different relationship between the between the two. But taking you know that that anthropological approach and applying it to the past, almost seeing the idea that you know the way that we as you know modern Westerners see the Roman world is you know is is quite an alien. It's quite an alien place for us. You know that we should be seeing the past in the way that we might almost look at you know, modern colonial encounters and you know, different cultures. So there's a lot of looking into religion, which is really influenced by studies of, of ethnography, uh, particularly in museums. Yeah. Does that answer the question? <laughs> yeah, I think, I think so. Um, there's, there, there, I mean, I have to say this, there, there aren't a huge lot of questions in here. It's, it's all, it's all comments and people reacting to comments. Um, somebody has offended made, anybody, I hope. That's, that's the, the big thing. But I, I, I can't, no, no, nobody seems to be offended yet. Well, that's not what I can see. Uh, there's still the time for somebody to tell us that they have it. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, paganism, I know, is a lot of different things. I, I'm using that word very generally. Somebody's uh, put a comment up saying, isn't paganism lots of different things? I think it is. But, um, I mean, for a, a, a lot of us um, here tonight, probably, um, we, no, there's a... Uh, I'm trying to change my words very carefully. Um, there's a there's a very much in this country at the moment. There's a Christians versus the rest kind of mentality, isn't there? So I think we're not Christians. We're um, if we're interested in old religions, we all, we we're kind of lumped together, um, maybe as um, as pagans. But in the past, of course, if we go back far enough, even to Roman times um, or before, there were probably lots of different. Christians. It wasn't just choice of the kind of conventional main religion or something else there were lots of different things to choose from yeah absolutely yeah um it's it's part of this bigger idea that even when we talk about religion and we conceive of the word religion we need to recognize that actually that that word and everything it means to us is very much biased by um a christian particularly a protestant christian you know history of, of scholarship you know a lot of the the enlightenment even if scholars weren't necessarily Christians themselves, that was very much the world they inhabited and that was their understanding of religion. And so we, we do naturally start to apply yeah, that, that lens when we look at the ancient world. And it's, it's trying to break out of that a little bit to recognise this great diversity of how people might engage yeah, with, with the supernatural, with the spiritual world around them. And modern paganism is, is kind of no, no different. To that i think yeah it, it is a very diverse community a completely diverse set of set of beliefs but you know important and interesting communities and i think there's always some of the examples it's that it's that sense of even if we don't believe in it ourselves even if you know some of the ideas seem a little bit <laughs> you know crazy at times yeah. Yeah, that's fine but it, it can lead to new ways of seeing about it so yeah people are you know recognizing the touching of statues and, yeah that example for you know for instance it can provide some interesting new perspectives and, and they're, they're groups that I think we'd, you know, get a lot of benefit out of engaging with more. Sure. sure. Um, the, the, um, the press cuttings that you put up with the Lincolnshire Vicar, mm. I thought were marvellous. Um, yeah, the great evil spirit in, in, <laughs> in my village. Um, I, but I mean, I, there, there is, 
I, I, I wrote down here, I'm not sure what to say about this, and I'm still not sure quite what to say about it, but <laughs> it, it, it was a really interesting example that you put up. I don't know if, there's, if you want to say any more about it or not, but it was... Um, yeah, no, was, I, 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 I know people who still live in that village, so maybe the evil presence is still there. <laughs> there <laughs> there's long yeah. been suspicions about the people living there. Right. Um, but but I, I, think, I think it just is, is really interesting because, um, and I, sh I should say as an addendum to this, that looking into little bits about the life of, of the vicar, you know, he, he wasn't generally some, you know, some crackpot. He seems to have been, you know, a, a real core of, of the community, you know, very well respected, very well thought of, you know, his obituary when he passed away was, you know, glowing, you know, he, he was clearly a really, really lovely man. Yeah. So no, not somebody who was prone to strange outbursts necessarily. And this just seemed to have prompted something which got picked right. up. And, you know, we're, we're working on a newspaper report, of course, so we don't get the chance to interview him to, to work out how they completely misquoted him, which of course we should probably no. you know, re remember no. what, what the media is like for this. But, uh, but uh, yeah, I, I think it's this sense of, it gives an awful lot of agency to gods that you would imagine he doesn't think are actually real creatures you know, or entities. Sure, it, it's giving a huge amount of power to them, and still in the modern day. So I, I just find that a really interesting case study and approach as to how people do view the you know, the spiritual and supernatural. And as I say, even if you're not a pagan, if you know, if you don't worship the gods of of Greece and Rome, they can still have this influence on on how you see the world. Yeah, sure. I mean, there's a um, interesting well, a couple of a comment and a question that kind of go together. Somebody was asking about the issue of continuity to do with. Um, this um, when we're saying about people still apparently worshiping ancient gods uh, and, and indeed paganism, um, to what extent is that a, a Victorian reinvention of something ancient, a sort of unfounded ancient heritage? And then uh, another, well, I think it's a really interesting question that we could probably talk about for a while. Why is antiquity seen as conferring authenticity? You've gone very quiet. Yeah, no, that's why, not my, that's why, not why, why, why is antiquity? <laughs> why is antiquity seen as conferring authenticity? I mean, there's an assumption there that it is, but it apparently is for some people. You know, if something's happened a long time ago, it does have some kind of authenticity uh, uh, about it. I suppose, we, yeah, we tend to have that idea that if something has somehow survived a long time. Um, but, yeah, no, it's, it's very true. A lot of the, the, particularly the druidic idea is very much a victorian reinvention yeah i mean and it's absolutely true um i think it's part of the idea though as to how much we want to see authenticity as being the most important driving factor i think that's something that we yeah th those of us with a, you know an academic interest in the past and a, and a desire to interpret the evidence to try and draw what we can from it to try and understand people in the past as much as possible authenticity is something that we we value highly even if it's something that we have to admit that we can never really you know fully fully get to grips with mm. Mm. but often people who are using it as as inspiration for the past it is so for their, for their own religious groups and their own religious interests they, they don't necessarily see authenticity as being that that important um they don't necessarily see a, a problem with taking a, a deity that we have you know attested in an inscription or taking a religious site you know an archaeological site and, and attributing it to a deity that's attested elsewhere even if there's no evidence connection between the two that's just their yeah it, it, it's ontological that's their way of, of engaging and understanding the, the universe around them and, and how the world works and i, I suppose there's a danger in in, in kind of imposing our academic perspective and our academic bias and kind of saying that they're somehow wrong for seeing it in a different way even if we can't necessarily always you know understand it ourselves on, on that kind of way so i suppose that, that that's kind of where i suppose I'm, I'm thinking of getting from rather than seeing it as a slightly wacky fringe or seeing it as lesser because it doesn't meet the standards of, of evidence that we might expect for academic inquiry of still saying no this is still of, of value these are still you know communities that that live with us today and this is their way of engaging with this ancient past you know and they have just as much right to to engage with it as anybody else does even if you know that they're not they're not basing it on on being authentic no yeah no. um yeah uh, I mean, I, I've written about Roman gods as Disney characters in the past, and because that's the way that that is the way that we see them, isn't it? Well, well indeed, they are Disney characters in some Disney films, and it, but at the same time, we have to remember that um, 
to the people who worshipped them in those times. They were as real as well any god is to to anybody today. Um, and sometimes we have to remind ourselves of that, I think, when we're looking at things like, I mean, I, yeah. it's something that occurred to me. You said, and I, I've probably written this down wrong, but um, you were talking about maybe Roman, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Roman gods not being as kind of emotionally connected with the landscape in some way as, as what, something along those lines about. Yeah, yeah, I think people don't necessarily see them as being quite as, engaging and but maybe it's because the roman period is just too ubiquitous maybe it's because these big you know gods of the, the greco-roman pantheon are just too famous sure. too well written about too well known mm. that actually people find they're not actually that exciting or there's they don't perceive that there's enough gray area around the margins for them to still be interesting or to still be explored in in the same yeah. way perhaps that's a way to, to look at it well i think there's a yeah that's kind of what i thought you were saying but there's a there's a big difference in, in well, is there? I don't know. There is a difference, anyway, between thinking in terms of these Roman gods at the big, um, big temples in I don't know, Corbridge or, or wherever, and going to a little shrine somewhere on the side of a hill um, and realizing that somebody had uh, left uh, an altar to a particular Roman god, um, you know, at some point in the past. That that that's. You know, just as, as emotional that's an emotional co um, connection with the place isn't it yes just the same way as if somebody uh three thousand years earlier had put up a standing stone for a similar reason mm, absolutely yeah and, and that little rural shrine to an unnamed god in the roman period yeah is, is all part of the same religious landscape as the more formal temple in a town and we tend to think of one as being roman and one as perhaps being somehow lesser or yeah somehow more yeah. native or traditional but it, it's not and i think that 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 perceived lack of emotion about roman religion is something that i'm i'm you know quite keen on on challenging um yeah. you know that this is something that did mean that did mean something to people you know going to, to to attend a formal festival at a you know a temple to a major god like jupiter or mars didn't mean that people weren't genuinely believing and, and you know and feeling and experiencing things when they were there but there is this sense i think that somehow prehistoric religion is somehow seen as being more more authentic more genuine more, more emotively felt more you know connected with with nature and that's yeah no roman religion has that and as i've said a lot of the you know the iron age the evidence for iron age religion we have does actually come from the roman period it's already being influenced by the roman world and roman approaches to how the gods should be depicted and worshipped it's already been you know, tainted if you want to see it that way yeah, absolutely. Speaking personally, I I see uh, I see Christianity. I don't wish to offend anybody here. I see Christianity in the same way as I see the Roman religions. They're brought they're brought in, and uh, well, I don't want to say they're imposed, but they you know they're brought in from a, from a kind of a, an alien place. And if you choose to believe, fine. But if well, I say choose to, if you believe, if you don't believe, I'm trying to put my words very carefully here. Um, uh, uh, but at the same thing, it, it is not a, it's not a native um, religion with any great um, time depth in the, in the British landscape, certainly. No, and in fact, it's almost obviously David, you know, stepping on David's toes with this, but the, that is, is actually one of the, yeah, it seems to be one of the big strong drivers about Christianity is that it's not tied to a particular place. A lot of the, the deities in the Greco-Roman world, you know, the temples are not just places where you go to worship the gods. They are an ides, they are the home of that god. You know, that is where Indeed. that particular deity dwells. Where Absolutely. The Christian god, of course, is 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 everywhere. He, he doesn't need a, a specific location it doesn't you know it can travel you know wherever it wants to travel so absolutely and that this is something i've got into trouble with you know saying in the past and it's it's very clear in numerous places in uh, in northeast england where um the power of the place um is lost when christianity becomes um permanently shall we say established uh, and all those places where the gods dwelt in the place become defunct almost and uh, I, I do wonder sometimes if we're moving back towards that a bit. I think I, mean, I think that the, the growth of spirituality is is yeah. very much there, yeah. And it's, it's it is one of the one of the other. I mean, I mentioned the yeah, material religion as, as a a move in scholarship, and one of the, the big other moves in contemporary religious studies is what's called lived religion, um, which is very much this idea that if you study people's individual religiosity 
not from a top-down perspective, not from thinking about, you know, what church do they belong to? You know, what are the structures of that? You know, they belong to the First Baptist Church. Therefore, this is what their beliefs are. If you start from the bottom up and actually say, what does this individual person believe and do? You start to get a, a much more diverse and, and personalised, you know, set of beliefs that people are picking and choosing makes it sound, makes it sound um, you know, rather flippant. I don't mean it that way, but, yeah. you know, people are, are individually you know making their own religious landscapes um and i think it 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 ties in as as part of that i think that people are perhaps mixing in parts of traditional um you know faiths such as christianity but also bringing in elements of what we might term more spirituality and part of like what you're saying yeah the reference to place i think comes in as part of that that the landscape maybe starts to come back into people's yeah own own personal religious maps I think so. Does in mind anyway. Uh, But um, yeah, somebody's sent an observation here. The London Mithraeum is now displayed in a way that creates a numinous experience. Could this be a model for future displays? Presumably elsewhere, his meaning. Yeah, I think it is. And obviously that's been quite um, an expensive thing. I don't know if that's something that can always be recreated elsewhere. But yes, obviously travelling has not been the easiest in recent times. And uh, obviously not everybody here is is from the UK, but the London Mithraeum is, is definitely somewhere to to go if you're interested in this even you know it, there's nothing else quite like it in terms of that that experience um i think there's still more that it could do in terms of actually interpreting the, the site but as a as an evocative experience I, yeah it, it does something really different and i think that's the sort of thing that perhaps i would like to see other places move move toward more, more of that sense of an experience as well as just you know raw, raw yeah. facts and data uh, i missed this one uh, so, somebody had sent in an observation about um tesco's being set up in old churches but i guess that's more to do with the fact that shopping is today's religion i don't know <laughs> but, um no reuse of i don't think tesco gets any more authenticity by being being based in an old church but hey maybe i'm maybe i'm wrong i kind of hope they don't but yeah, yeah. um <laughs> yeah there's all sorts of uh, questions coming in um i I find it interesting that we often question the authenticity of many pagan and ancient religious beliefs but not the major religions when major religions like christianity have been adapted and altered hundreds of times since their inception just the same so yeah i mean there are different kinds of christianity aren't there well, yeah, exactly. And obviously the, the Christianity that somebody in the, let's even say, you know, the second and third century, let alone the fourth century would, you know, if you could bring somebody from then forward in time to now, I think it's fair to say that the Christianity that they would see now wouldn't necessarily be something that they would entirely recognise. Yeah, religions are like anything else. They, they adapt and they change to, to meet the needs of the societies that they're, that they're functioning in. Um, but yeah, I think it's a very, it's an incredibly valid point that we, we do perhaps apply greater scrutiny or criticize or you know, demean some of the pagan groups for, for their lack of authenticity. And yeah, maybe we don't uh, entirely yeah. fairly <laughs> yeah, distribute that, that similar. Mm. And there's a reference here um, to the Rudston monolith, which is of course another excellent Neolithic site. Great site yeah. um, the Rudston monolith is in a churchyard. So continuity of veneration of the place or the usurping of an earlier belief. Hey, there we go. We need an hour to talk about that. But yeah, is it about continuous veneration of the place? Um, I, you see, sorry, I shouldn't be answering these questions. I should be asking them. But I mean, <laughs> that, 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 that's a key issue there because you don't need a veneration. You don't need veneration of place for Christianity. You know, you can put you can put a church anywhere because your God is kind of up there rather than in, in the ground anywhere. It seems to me a Christian church can be built anywhere as long as it's facing in the right direction and the right things are done at the right times. Um, so I don't know if it is continued veneration of place or whether it's more about the usurping of earlier belief or earlier power of place. But I think that's another. I think that's another subject for another day. It is, but it, but it is an interesting idea that yeah, that these this continuity this yeah this persistence of 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 place which yeah doesn't have to be Mm. about control or or disrespect it can even be about you know a reverence for a place recognized as special absolutely Mm. Um, how much did how much did romans take over earlier significant sacred places they did to a certain extent there there certainly is a a continuity as far as we can tell of um, you know iron age into roman um, sites but even just out, outside of religious sites, so there's some interesting work that goes on that looks at how like Roman road networks and Roman settlements 
um, there's been some work down in, in the southeast in Kent on this um, about you know even like Bronze Age barrows and things you know the, the Bronze Age landscape seems to be things that have you know reflected and, and respected so I think that there there is uh, you know evidence for a certain amount of respect of, of what's coming before in a landscape um, particularly a sacred nature whether that's out of a pure reverence or you know a, a superstitious fear of not doing things correctly and ending up you know angering <laughs> angering something you don't want to anger i don't know but i think there is a certainly evidence for yeah for, for some respect of previous yeah <clears throat> sure um just a, a comment that somebody's made here um forgive me i haven't read out everybody's name with their questions because that would just confuse me even more than <laughs> trying to keep up <laughs> one of these points um early christian missionaries often used pagan places of worship on which to build their churches there is evidence of this on Hadrian's Wall. I mean, yeah, I, I totally agree with that. That's when Christianity is new. That's when Christianity is trying to take over everything else. So obviously they have to take over the, um, the, the, the important pagan places. But once Christianity is established, the point I'm trying to make is then you can build a church absolutely anywhere and it doesn't really matter. And that's when you lose the connection with places. I hope that makes sense. Um, Oh, I've lost. Uh... I don't know the thing. I just said I've just noticed on my on my screen at the minute. I'm it's it's behind on on the comments, but I've just noticed there's a message from Claire Slack saying that's my PhD topic: bothering pagans at sacred sites. If you're doing research, uh, send me an email. I'd love to know what you're doing on that. That's, yeah, well, uh, good. better than that, give us a lecture. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah um, uh, oh, by the way, I was going to say to you. I meant to, I meant to say to you at the start of the questions as well. You had one from New Zealand sign in just as you were starting, so I think that's the oh, record. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Well done. Whoever's well, come from New Zealand, that's the record. I don't think we're going to get further away than that. So if we do, yeah. no, I hope you've got impressive. a strong coffee. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I've got all the questions mixed up on my screen now. I'm afraid. I think I've. I hope I've covered all of the the key issues that people were asking. There's lots and lots of comments about. Yeah. No. Thank you for the, the, the comments. Stuff. But. Um, I'm going to just uh, uh, two new messages. My, they message my emails in a minute. If anybody's got a really pressing question that we don't get to in the do what and answer, then do please email it to me if it's anything that I might be able to uh, to answer in a, in yeah, a constructive um, way. But, right. uh, I think I think we're just we're just getting um, you know we're just getting um, uh, uh, comments now. Uh, there's a nice one to end on. Thank you so much, Anthony. As a modern pagan focused on Roman gods, I found this a really fair, open-minded, and interesting talk. So well, well, thank you. <laughs> maybe we should, that, that, we should end on that one. Oh, well, that, that does actually mean a lot. So thank you for that. Because, yeah, that's, as I say, I think that's something that I think we should aim for in, the, in this. <laughs> Very much. But, well, thank you. Well done. Brilliant. Back to you, David. Well, I'd say thank you very much. Uh, I, I, I think the, the amount of questions and comments uh, reflects the, the, the how engaged people were. Um, I was just going to say, Anthony, do you know, just pop your email into the chat just for so mm. anybody who wants to contact you can, will, can yes. find you. I'll do my funny um, spider I'll, fingers. And I'll come. let him do that and I'll, I'll keep on talking for a moment to make sure people actually have time to, to send <laughs> the copy it down. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, Anthony's at Durham University, so uh, a bit of basic Googling. Should be able to should be able to find him fairly, if the, if the fairly easily. But, uh, David, David yeah, there's a there's a task for for you and me there, David. We've got to do some. I mean, whatever pagan, it, whatever paaganism is, it's clearly something that people have got a lot of interest in, and we need to address I think we it. Need to do some a sort of on con, a workshop on contemporary paganism, don't we? I yeah, that's going to be, that's, that'd be really <laughs> really good. Yeah. And tie in some of the work we're doing with with our Holy Wells project as well, looking at how how yeah, those are still being used. Okay, so with that, I just want to thank everybody for their for their patience and their, their thoughtful comments. As I said, next week we have Lindsay Allison Jones talking about how the Romans thought about Roman religion rather than how we think about Roman religion. And then uh, the week after that, there'll be me talking about Roman Christianity uh, rather, rather, rather appositely. So uh, as I said, this is, has been recorded. It will be placed on our YouTube channel in the next couple of days. It'll take me, take me a day or two to get it all sorted out. Um, but thank you very much for coming and hopefully see some or most or even all of you next week. I'm now going to end the session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for all the comments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.